Welcome back to section 6.2, the characteristic polynomial for the textbook linear algebra done openly. Uh, in this example, I want to look at another, I want to find the eigenvalues of another two by two matrix. Um, you can see the previous example for a pretty benign example of calculating those. And so to find the eigenvalues of a matrix, we typically could calculate the characteristic polynomial. Let's do that for this matrix right here. From the get-go, it seems quite similar. Uh, you, you might not expect much different going on here, but the characteristic polynomial is the determinant of A minus lambda I, which you see right here. As it's two by two, we can just take the product of the diagonals and subtract those from each other. Uh, doing that, we're gonna get negative lambda times negative lambda minus negative one times one, uh, which would simplify to be lambda squared plus one. In which case you look at that thing, it's like, okay, we got to factor this to get the, the eigenvalues here, uh, you know, set it equal to zero. Mm, factor, factors of one that add up to be zero. Uh, one plus one is two, negative one plus negative one is negative two. Oh, that seems weird. Maybe I don't know how to factor today. Um, well, I guess I could use the quadratic form and that always works out here, but I'm just going to treat this as a, as just as an equation with two terms there. Subtract one from both sides. Uh, you end up with uh, lambda squared equals negative one. And if we take the square root of both sides, we now see the issue that's going on here. We're gonna get that lambda equals plus or minus the square root of negative one, AKA plus or minus I. And so it turns out that according to the characteristic polynomial, the eigenvalues of this matrix are plus or minus I. And I want you to notice here that this original matrix here um, is a real matrix but its, it's uh, eigenvalues are actually not real numbers. They're, they're, they're imaginary numbers, right? These all sit inside of the field, the complex numbers. And this is something that you have to kind of deal with when you work with, eigen, with eigenvalues. That even if you have a matrix whose scalars come from a certain field, so let's say our scalars come from some field F, it might be necessary to extend the field uh, so this is often called in the literature an extension field. Sometimes you have to go to a bigger field in order to um, in order to find the eigenvalues. And this is actually some interesting stuff that you can see in abstract algebra, for which I don't want to dive too much into that at this moment here. But in particular, as we look for real, if we have real matrices, we sometimes have to extend to the complex number field to find those eigenvalues. And this actually kind of is the one reason why we've justified working with uh, complex numbers this entire uh, course. That even though our main goal is going to be on real matrices and real vectors, sometimes we have to use complex numbers as we study these eigenvalues and the like. So if we had um, we have these imaginary eigenvalues, what does that say about the matrix? Well, we could start finding eigenspaces. Could we find the I eigenspace? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, what we want to do is we want to look at the null space of the matrix A minus II. Horrible pun right there, though. But little i and then the identity matrix there. Um, so let, let's look at that for a second. If we take the matrix I minus II, uh, this would look like our original matrix. Remember, we're going to take 0 minus I. So we get minus 1, 1, and minus I like so. And let's try to row reduce this thing. And I want to do this in the least painful ways possible. So I want to row reduce this so I can find a basis for the null space. Let's switch the order of the rows here. And so this gives us one negative I, negative I, negative one. And so with my pivot there in the first one, in the one, one position, I can get rid of the negative one below it by taking row two and adding to it I times row one. So we're going to get a plus I right here. And so then we're going to get, uh, if you take negative I times I, that's actually a positive one. So we're going to add one right there. And so as we row reduce this, we end up with one minus one over zero over zero. Now it turns out I didn't have to do this calculation at all, really, because one thing you should remember about, um, about eigenvalues is eigenvalues were chosen so that the matrix A minus lambda I is singular. If you have a singular square matrix, it means it has an echelon form with a row of zeros, which if I know there's gonna be a row of zeros, what that means is from the original problem, I could have just killed off my least favorite row um, 
and gone from there. That is the last row you could always ignore, or in this case, I'm just going to take the... I actually want the last row because it has a one in there. We could have gotten to this a lot quicker. Anyways, uh, just kind of a little, a little trick there you can do with eigenvalues. You can ignore some of the rows because we know it's going to be singular. Uh, I mean, you do have to be a little bit careful, right, when you have lots of rows because um, you have dependence relationships because uh, it could be that some rows are independent of each other and some are not. So you can always get rid of the last row if you don't want it uh, to kind of save you a step when you're doing these uh, doing these calculations here. So with this with this matrix row reduced, if we wanted to find a vector x, uh, which will give us the eigen the eigen space, the basis for the null space, take x one to be x two, uh, we can interpret, of course. Um, x1 as a free variable, sorry, x1 is the dependent variable and x2 is the free variable. So we get x2 right here. Then x1 will be i times x2. And so we get x2 times i comma one. And so this, this right here gives us a basis for the, for the null space. So our null space, we can write as the span. It's gonna be the complex span of this vector i1. Uh, you have to be careful with this vector. It makes you feel cocky because, you know, you, you, it makes you feel cocky because you think you win all the time. Uh, but we can actually choose this vector I1 uh, to be uh, an eigenvector. So this is this is an eigenvector, but this is going to be our representative here, the eigenvector that we want uh, for this uh, for this matrix. Um, can we replicate this process for negative I minus the negative I eigenspace? Uh, that is, we want to find the null space actually of a plus i, i. And so when we do that, um, we have to look at a plus i, i, uh, which looks like the matrix i minus 1, 1, i, like so. And so kind of repeating the row operations we did before, we can switch the order 1, i, i, negative 1. And like I was saying earlier, we, we can ignore the second row because we actually know there's going to be a row of zeros popping up. So no arithmetic is necessary there. We get one, I, zero, zero. And so as we start looking for the general solution to that homogeneous system, uh, we get X1, X2. Well, we get X2 is our free variable. X1 would have to be negative I, X2. And so factoring out the X2, uh, we get negative I, one. Like, so I guess that means I lose. Uh, something like that. Anyways, so this uh, this this would give us the complex basis for our eigenspace right here, uh, which would just be the span of negative i one, and in particular we get this this eigenvalue right here. This is our eigenvector. I should I meant to say. All right. Now I want you to sort of look at the connection between this vector, these two vectors here, right? Uh, we have the first vector whose eigenvalue was i, and the eigenvector was i1. Then for the second eigenvalue, we had negative i, and then the vector was uh, negative i1, right? The relationship here between i and negative i, I want you to notice that these are complex conjugates of each other complex conjugates. What about these two vectors, i1 versus negative i1? These are likewise complex conjugates of each other. And this is actually a pattern we see in much more generality here, that um, if we have a matrix A and all of its entries are real, so it's a real matrix, if you take A bar X, well, because of properties of conjugation, that's what the bar means. You can actually take the conjugate of the first matrix in the vector, and this will equal a x bar. And this is because if A is a real mat matrix, taking its conjugate doesn't do anything. Uh, so when you conjugate things, you get this right here. And so if A x, so if x is an eigenvector, this has the property that th if, if x is an eigenvector, that means that A x will equal lambda x right here. Uh, so when you take the conjugate of this right here, you're going to get that A x bar equals A x bar over everything you get lambda x bar, but then you're gonna get lambda bar x bar. And so when you see what's going on here is that if you have a real matrix, um, eigenvalues, eigenvalues, they come in conjugate pairs. And that's kind of interesting. So once you find one, 
Once you find one uh, complex root, you find the other by looking at these conjugate pairs. But it's also true for eigenvectors, that if you find an eigenvector for an eigenvalue, they're likewise going to come in these conjugate pairs. And so one of the neat thing is that actually when you find a non-real eigenvalue, that almost seems like sad news. Oh no, I, I like real numbers. But actually it's like, oh sweet! When you find one, when you find the when you find the eigenspace for that one eigenvalue, you don't have to actually calculate the second eigenspace. That is to say, when it came to this problem right here, we didn't need to do this part of the calculation because we actually knew that once we had this eigenvalue and this eigen this eigenvector right there, we're able to get the other eigenvalue by conjugation, and we can get the other eigenvalue by conjugation as well. And so that's actually a, re a neat little trick we can do working with uh, complex eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And so I want to come back to the original matrix A and kind of explain why why did this matrix end up with uh, these imaginary eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? When it comes to when it comes to what does this matrix do geometrically, we talked about previously how geometric, uh, how two by two matrices affect the plane. And you'll notice that this matrix right here uh, has the effect that this is rotation uh, by 90 degrees, right? It's a rotating matrix. So if we take the X and Y axis right this, uh, the effect is if you take a point, you're going to move it by 90 degrees counterclockwise there. Well, what if you have a vector? like this. If you rotate that vector, it's going to be up here. So if it was on the x-axis, it's going to rotate to be the, the y-axis right there. But an eigenvector has the property that when you act by the matrix, you end up with something in the original span. So what line that goes to the origin will not be affected by rotation by 90 degrees? If we keep our if we keep our real number blinders on, we can only see the real the real axes. Then we're not going to see any vectors who don't get rotated um, by this, and that's why we have to expand our horizon and go to this extension field, aka the complex numbers. That all the real real matrices will be uh, sorry, real vectors will be rotated by this matrix. Complex vectors will actually be scale. Uh, I should say imaginary vectors will be scaled by this matrix. And so sometimes in order to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we have to extend to the complex numbers, even if the original setting was a real setting. And that might seem like, well, why do we want to do that? Well, that's because at this stage, we're really mostly just calculating, um, we're calculating what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. We'll see very soon why we like them so much. And so even a complex uh, eigenvector is still pretty awesome. And so we'll talk about some more of those in upcoming videos. Uh, stay tuned for them. Bye.